So um, I have been a map uh, enthusiast since I was lit really little. Um, I guess many people love maps. And uh, I wanted to, at one point I thought my dream job would be working in a map store or something. I didn't really know about cartographers. Um, and I've, I've sort of woven in and out of doing things professionally with maps, but never really worked with them a whole lot. And um, of course, sea kayaking, if it does nothing else, will probably give you lots of reasons to want maps and use maps. So um, I started doing what, what a lot of us have tried doing to make my own maps, um, downloading PDFs. I figured out where to get them from, from NOAA. Uh, trying different visual tools to cut them up and paste them up and put grid lines on top and this and that and the other thing. And um, then I heard about, um, I had used real map making software a couple of times for work, but really only very incidentally. And I knew it was very expensive, at least I thought it was. Then I found out from some folks in the Bay Area about the open source free um, and very powerful uh, geographic information system, which is what these things are called in the software realm. Map, uh, software that works with maps and with spatial information or geospatial information. It's free. You can pay for it. They would love donations. I hope uh, some of you will consider donating to them if it works out for you. But um, I've been working with this program QGIS for about a year and it has quite a steep learning curve. And what I've tried to do is use that time and my programming background to uh, adapt it and make it much easier to use for the specific purpose of creating um, trip plans and charts for us, for kayakers. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through all, pretty much all the things that are in the online uh, you know, the website that I created for guiding folks through uh, what they need to know to make nice charts with QGIS. Um, and as many of you know, if you read your email this week, uh, we had a lot of problems um, accessing some of the resources that had been working great right up until the weekend um, that uh, from NOAA that are really valuable. It actually wound up forcing me to find a whole bunch of better ways to do it than I'd been doing. So I think we've actually wound up in a better place. That's easier to do the things we need to do. So a word about the format here. A lot of people can't come and they wanna see the recording. What I'm gonna to try to do is bunch uh, presentation into maybe you know, 15, 20 minute chunks where I'll just go through something and perform it. And then I'll stop for a bit we can have a little Q&A. Um, I'll have to be very attentive to how much. And then I'll continue. I expect we'll get through it all because it's actually not, um, I'm not, I'm not gonna be breaking you out into groups or anything and we're not gonna do exercises together. It's just too complicated to herd a, a largest group through that. Um, so my goal is to come out of this with having walked through it in front of you, you've all seen it, you can ask some questions and there'll be a recording to refer to so that for folks who either weren't here or um, if you wanna polish up you know, your technique afterwards and walk through the things, you've got the video now as an additional resource. That's, that's my idea. Sound good? Any questions before we start? Oh, cool. Sounds good. All right. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get going. So let's minimize junk. That, whoops, I meant minimize, not maximize. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so much stuff here that you don't need to see. All right. Um, let's open QGIS. I'm not gonna go through the installation. Um, if people have had problems installing, uh, we can deal with those later. So here's QGIS. And uh, let me also get a nice uh, browser window open. 
on um, the little website. Here it is. So um, I'm going to just literally do the things that are in this website, but I'm not going to always I'm not going to always have this page up. I'm just going to use it to kind of as a, as an outline for me, and so that I can actually download the things the same way you would download them. So I'm going to begin by downloading the sample project. You may notice it's changed its name yet again. It's now workshop template two, because I changed it again today after I found a way better way to do something. So for all of you who got template number one, there's now template number two, which is way better. Let me download it. And uh, there it is. I can open it up in QGIS. I could use the project menu and just say open and you know browse my way to it. In fact, there it is. What I'm gonna do first though is copy it somewhere else because that's really a good idea as a first move. So um, let me just sort of move it into, let's make a new folder. Joe? Um, yep. Can I ask one quick question? You I, bet, yep. Do, do you want us to ask questions as you're going or do I, you want to- I would like you to again? maybe uh, note, note questions for a little bit and I will stop every now and then and ask you. Okay. Ask for questions. Um, but right now, all I'm doing is um, making up just a place to put this project. So workshop project. I hope the type on my screen is not too small. Let's put this in a little bit. So if I downloaded it before it stopped working, I have the wrong download now? Yeah, you, everybody okay. should re-download it again after this. Yeah. OK, so I here is the file that I just downloaded, I'm going to move it to a brand new folder. And that's a good idea because everything that it needs is going to wind up living in this folder. So it's good to have a folder dedicated just to this QGIS project. Okay, from here, I could open it. And uh, I think on most computers, you can also just drag this file out of this window and drop it onto the QGIS application. And if you do that, it will open up. And there it is. So here we are, QGIS is open on our project and we're looking at um, what I call a base map. It's, uh, it's a sort of a background map, not necessarily the best quality that you can get, but it is a, it is a composite of NOAA charts that um, will show you where you are no matter where you go. Um, I'll stop to take questions now for a second. Someone had a question before. I actually just, my question was really more what, what you call the template was just a project file. So it was some kind of, I, I'm kind of asking, but making sure that just yeah. what you were saving there was just, here's a map that I saved. Let me explain what a project is. That's a really good question. <clears throat> A project in QGIS, it is a file, and it is a file that remembers a whole bunch of things. It remembers a bunch of different layers, and I'll tell you what a layer is in a moment, but they are the information that can be on the map. Um, there are many different layers you can have, you know, like satellites or street maps or grids, lots of different th layers that you can put on top of each other and turn on and off. So that's one thing that, that a project is, is it's a, a layer collection. It also remembers where you were looking last in that project. So when we opened it up, we came to Boston because when I saved it, I was looking at Boston Harbor. If I go somewhere else, you know, let's go up to Nahant. And if I save it now, when I open it up again, I'll be looking at Nahant. So it remembers not just uh, the data that it was looking at, but also where you were positioned in it. And it also remembers something called layouts, but we'll get to that in a second. We're building towards it. So you need the project open to access the set of things that you're gonna be working with. So far, so good, I hope. So let's talk about getting around on the map for a second. Um, one of the things you spend a lot of time doing in a software program like this 
is panning and zooming. So when, when Q just starts, you see this little hand up here in the corner? That hand tool is a pan tool. And it means if I drag the map, it's just gonna move from place to place. And you'll notice it's, it's just filling in as I move. Even though I'm really going from one NOAA chart to another, that's because my background map is loaded from a special set of NOAA servers that deliver chunks of chart to my computer as I move around the map. So I don't have to download any specific charts to do this. That's one sort of immediate big convenience. Now, zoom, uh, panning is all very good, but let's say I wanna go to uh, like Mount Desert Island. Do I now have to like drag the map, you know, 10 miles at a time? Um, it's gonna take me forever. Also, maybe this isn't the right scale that I wanna look at. So the other thing you're gonna find yourself doing a whole lot of is zooming. And zooming in QGIS is probably um, one of the trickier things to learn, but uh, it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. You have to use, uh, you have to use the right mouse button, which, uh, or if your mouse has a wheel, you can use that scroll wheel. And what you have to do is, cl is click the right mouse button and move down or up. So I'm moving down right now and the scale is getting bigger and then zooming in. And if you use the right mouse button and go out, go up, excuse me, you zoom out and the map keeps adapting. You'll notice it keeps changing the level of detail, kind of like Google Maps does, but with charts. Joe, can I jump in for a second? Because yeah. we, when we were working, um, we realized that that doesn't work with Windows-based computers. Oh yeah, can you explain how you do this on Windows? Okay. So I, I didn't even know this worked. Well, you've got two different ways to that you can zoom in Windows. You, there's a zoom button um, up, up at the top of the QGIS thing for a plus and a minus button yes. that you're probably used to. But you can also, if you have your cursor in the map, you can put, well, on a laptop, I'm not sure how this works with a mouse. On a laptop, you can put two fingers um, on your um, pad and draw them closer to you. Oh yes, it's Move called in. the scroll gesture, right? That's how you scroll a window on Windows, right? Yeah, so two fingers bring and drag them towards you, zooms in and away from you zooms out. Thank you, Jim. That's a really good observation because actually on a Mac, the way you do it is also the same way you scroll a window. Here I am putting down two fingers and scrolling this little window here on the left. And if you do the same thing in the map, it gets bigger and smaller. So whatever you do to scroll a window on your computer, that's what you should be doing to make the map zoom in and out. Okay. Um, and you spend a lot of time panning and zooming because that's how you get from one place to another. We were trying to get to MDI and the way you do that is you zoom way out, find your way to MDI. There it is, it's in the center of the map. It's probably hard, unreadable, but I recognize the shape and zoom back in. And there we are, MDI. We can really get very detailed if we want. So panning and zooming are really key. Um, another really foundational kind of thing in QGIS is the layers, and we talked about them before. So over here on the left, there's a layers windows, layers panel, excuse me. I'm highlighting different things within it just to make it easier to see where it is. Each layer has a checkbox. And the checkbox says whether you can see it or not. So right now, NOAA raster charts is checked. So I'm looking at NOAA raster charts, the sort of background for everything. If I turn it off, this is what I see, nothing. I have no idea where I am. And there are other layers too that you can turn on and off. So there's, uh, I've put a couple of standard issue layers in here because they're helpful to have. You can have satellite, 
This is Google Maps satellite view of exactly the same area or uh, open street map, which is a street map. So these are all um, what are called raster layers. They're picture layers. There are also other um, layers that are overlays of information. So for instance, um, other layers we have in here, we have a magnetic grid for all of New England that I just turned on. Here, I'll turn off the other thing. Can people see the grid? Yep. Yep, and each grid line is, if you hover over that grid line, um, sorry, I'm, if you hover over the grid line, um, you will actually, oh, it's actually labeled too. All the lines are labeled with their uh, magnetic variation. So anywhere in New England, I made this grid for you so that um, you, know, you could always have a nice grid to use. They're spaced uh, a nautical mile apart. Later, we'll be seeing how you can make your own grids for other places. But so there's a grid layer. Um, let's put OpenStreetMap back. Um, I put in current and tide stations. So um, these are kind of nice too. If you um, highlight a layer and hover over one of the things in it, you will often get a little message. Like here, I got a message for Bar Harbor, view station data. And if I click that, it'll open the station webpage from cool. NOAA. So it's another thing we can do in this environment is just in, make it really easy to integrate a whole lot of other information that is helpful. So we have, you know, we might, we might open a completely different tide station. Maybe we wanna look at a current. I'll hover over a current and uh, we can view that station page. We probably have to pick one. Oh, that one doesn't seem to actually have any data. Let's pick this one instead. So yeah, it's, that's kind of nice just to have that at your fingertips if you're planning a trip. Um, more on that later. And uh, finally, we also have an overlay, and this is important for our workshop, of uh, the rectangle, the shapes covered by all the specific NOAA charts. So um, we'll see why those matter so much in a moment. But I think first, after a pause for questions, we're just gonna go ahead and actually make our first map, um, printable, printable map. So um, yeah, questions really, so far? Really quick question. The yeah. reason these, these eight or nine super useful things are available is because you built them pre into the template, right? Yeah, I, br I built them into the template and in some cases um, did, some, did some programming to make them um, very accessible. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, but I've built these things and put them together and made them interactive for you guys. They, they, it's not like this out of the box. If you open QGIS out of the box, you, you see blank space. <laughs> I got a basic question, then a, a yeah, little more involved yeah. question. The basic question is, I saw that you were single clicking on, say, a, a tide station and you saw some data. I, I have the hand currently. How did you get that arrow to, so that you could select it? Like my hand doesn't yeah. allow me to. So here's what you, you have to do a couple of things together to hover over something and get data. First of all, its layer has to be selected on the left. See where current stations is selected in this panel? That's one thing you've got to do. The second thing you've got to do is there's this uh, icon up here that says show map tips. Ah. Can you see that? It's a, like a speech balloon icon. Yep. And that has to be turned on or this feature doesn't work. Then uh, regardless of whether you have the hand or not, you just hover over a current station and you'll get the little pop-up like that. And then you can click the link. It takes a little practice. I think the middle of the hand needs to be over the symbol, <laughs> the fat part of the palm. Is anyway. there any chance it's different on Windows? Because I'm, I'm having trouble with that too. 
Yeah, I don't know. We we can sure. if we have time are all afterwards. Are cyan triangles the stations? The triangles are the current stations, and the the, the, yeah, the diamonds are the tide stations. Either. Hey, you may not have show map tips turned on. It it's there's a box around it when it's on, correct? There's a box around it when it's on. All right. Yeah, I right. have it on now. I've tried it both ways. <laughs> All right. I, I trust you. But I, well, just, uh, I'll what, play with you know, it. What we can do later, um, later in the presentation, we'll have some opportunities for you to share your screen, hopefully. And then I can see what's going on and hopefully help you. And I, my more involved question, and you can just answer it generically, but you know, when you say that you programmatically created or added these later layers into your template. Yeah. How did you do that? Was it like Python? Was it? Yes, it's Python. And you were following their example, like through the the, the website that you had there that you were show, showing us earlier, the Joe Berkowitz, um, joeberkowitz.github.io. Yeah, Udis. well, that is, that's my website. Right. So, that information I see, is there somewhere in there that it's showing you how to? Script in Python and QGIS? Yeah. Or, or no, you'd have to read APIs. all the QGIS documentation and um, QGIS has its own documentation that's very involved. I, I, I saw that. I, I, was, I hadn't gone through your whole thing. I wasn't sure if that was, you included some examples there or not. No, that, I didn't include examples, but if you if you Google around, if you're interested in scripting this environment, you, you'll find you'll find a lot. There's okay. a lot of stuff out there. Um, I certainly made use of many other people's examples. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. So let's make a map with what we've got now. Um, maybe we can just try making a map of the Cranberry Islands off of Mount Desert. So, um, and here they are. Not in a whole lot of detail. Um, you'll notice that this sort of background basic map that we have, it, it keeps adjusting its detail. And when you look at an area, you often don't see enough detail. Like if we zoomed in, we'd see all the, you know, the good stuff about what's going on around the cranberries, where are the ledges and the rocks and stuff. Looking at the area that we want to make a map of, though, it's all blanked out. But don't worry about that. We're, we're we're going to deal. So this so far, what I've shown you is a great tool for just browsing navigational charts and browsing information related to them. But that's all we're doing is browsing. You can't print from this screen. This screen is just a view, sort of like a, an overview. Um, it's not something that you can make a PDF from. To do that, we need to make something called a layout. A layout is a special object in your project. It has its own window and its own kind of, um, it targets a specific area of your main map. So that's what we're going to do next is make one of those. So following the, uh, the same instructions that we had, uh, um, that we were working from before, I'm going to just do the same thing it says to do, open the layout manager. And I've given you four basic layouts, um, two different scales, two different orientations. They're all 11 by 17. You can change all those things, but these are the combinations that I found most useful. Wait a minute. Yep. I don't even, oh, oh layout manager, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So I'm gonna pick the one I want and I'm gonna just go for um, maybe portrait, no, landscape one to 50K. That's sort of the larger scale of the two. I'm gonna click duplicate and give it a name, cranberries. And up comes my new layout. And wait a minute, why is it showing the Isle of Shoals? It's because I copied a template layout. It's not showing the right area yet. It's remembering the area that the template was pointed at, kind of like the way the project was pointed at Boston Harbor when I opened it. So we need to change this to point to the right area. The very first thing we're gonna do is click the map to select it. 
And over here on the right, in the item properties tab, there's a row of icons just above all the controls. The very, uh, the very first one is a refresh button that doesn't do much. The second one is key. That makes your, your layout map point to the same as your main map, right? The main so. map's pointed at the cranberries. Layout map is still on the Isle of Shoals. I'm gonna click this button and now my layout map is pointed at the cranberries. Map one. Yeah, it's called map one in, in the layout. It, it did the opposite for me. I'm completely <laughs> lost. Well, try to follow along with me as yeah, best yeah, you yeah. can for a moment. I yeah, can't work with have... the map and follow you at the same time. It doesn't work. I'm, I beg your pardon? I can't work with my map to figure it out. and Don't work you with your it. map. Watch what I'm doing. All right. And then um, while this isn't a sort of a follow along and do everything that I do kind of thing, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to too much trouble. We can try to address problems afterwards more easily than during, I think. OK. Um, all right. So I've pointed the layout map at the same area as the main map now. And um, if I did nothing else, I would be able to export a PDF from here. It looks pitiful because there's no detail, but you'll see that when we export the PDF, detail will appear because it will refine the scale of the map to match the PDF, to match the PDF resolution. So let's try it. I'm clicking, uh, I clicked the export icon at the top, whoops. But I think I'll just use, um, I'll use the menu to make it clear what I'm doing. Export as PDF. And uh, I need to go to, I need to find that folder that I just made. Workshop project. We'll save it there. I will get another dialog and click save. And there's going to be a pause while it does whatever it does. And now it says it successfully exported the layout. If I click the link in this little um, message I got, it'll take me to a, a, a regular file browser window showing me the PDF. And I can open that in Acrobat. And there it is. So not too bad. It's got a lot of detail, certainly. Not, it even has about the right level of detail for me. But I think this map is not the best. I mean, it's got a lot of open space on it, a lot more than I would like. If I was using this on my spray deck, I mean, even if it was right in front of me, I'd have to, my eyesight's not that good. I'm wasting a lot of space on all this open water where I'm not even going to go. So we kind of need to fine tune this map. So let's go back to the layout and see how to do that. In the layout, I'm going to zoom it a little bit. It got a little more detail as a result. In the layout, whoops, sorry, I just flipped windows without meaning to. Here's my layout. In the layout, I can zoom the map by using something called the move tool. Uh -huh. It's this four arrow icon on the left. You can also get to it by doing um, edit, move content. This is all discussed in the website. Wow. So now when I drag around, I can actually reposition mm -hmm. the map within the layout. And you can see okay. the grid lines are moving as I do that. Yep. I can also yep. zoom the map and you'll see the scale bar gets bigger as I do that. Mm -hmm. So now I've got my map kind of zeroing in on mm -hmm. the cranberries. I'm, I'm going to go back to the regular 
pointer tool mm -hmm. and get my scale bar back into a place that, that looks good because it's it went off the map when I did that. Mm -hmm. Let's also make our title nice. Come on, stop. Okay, nice. how about that? Let's nice. re-export. Nice. Oh, somebody wants attention. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see how this looks. Cool. Much better. Yep. That I would not mind having on my deck. Not at all. Cool. So that's the fundamentals of making um, a printable map in QGIS. And now I can take some questions. Do I have to have Adobe to print or will it print right from here? Uh, I think I wouldn't, I, I've never printed straight from there because I, it, it'll, it'll want to print 11 by 17. I mean, do you have a large format printer? Yeah, it's got a print icon. I guess it'll print. I've never tried it. Um, I always export it to PDF so I can look at it and see if I like it first before I waste ink on it. Well, once it's in a PDF, is it, I mean, you can make a PDF, but can you only view it with Adobe or does? No, you can look at it in any any program that would look, you can. view a PDF. You can okay. print it from any program that would print a PDF. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's just a regular PDF. You, you can also, because it's proportional, you can print it on eight and a half by 11 if you want to. And what I often do is I, I bought some waterproof paper, which I really, really like. And I'll print eight and a half by 11s on my laser printer. They sit nicely on my deck, whereas 11 by 17s actually kind of crowd the deck. And if you get your scales to a place that works, uh, you can get a lot of information on eight and a half by 11. Yeah, and you can tape them together and do all kinds of stuff. That's what I do. Um, no, Joe, I have a question me, too. I'm still having trouble with the program. And we talked about this maybe a week ago and I re-downloaded the latest version, but it's still hanging up on rendering when I go to the layout manager. Do I need to go back to the download page again? I, I, I don't know. I don't know what template you're using now or, you know, what layer you're using. So um, a lot of things have changed since even Monday, you know? The, the version I'm using is 3.18.1. No, no, not, not, the ver not the version of QGIS. You, oh, by the way, no one should be using 3.18. That is the bleeding edge development version. Should only use 3.16. Oh. I was... Um the, the website's pretty clear on that. Don't download the development version. Yeah, so if 3.18 crashes, all bets are off. You know, it's, it's like an experimental version of QGIS. So that's what my issue is probably. Could be, could be, I don't know. You know the, the first time I went into Layout Manager, I've done it like three times. The first three times it worked great. And then I'm trying to do it now and I'm just getting the rendering map with the little blue bar spinning on the bottom. So I'm sort of, it was working fine two minutes ago and now um, it's just spinning. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's not the most stable program in well, the world. You might actually have to just quit it and restart it. Sometimes. Yeah, that's what I would think to do. It is not, know? I will say this is, you know, not the, neither the friendliest nor the most stable piece of software no. I've ever used. Well, you get what you pay for, you know, so it's a bargain. Yeah, it, it is a bargain. I mean, it works quite often. I, <laughs> I do have one trivial question though. When you went into move mode, which yeah. icon was that on the left? Well, in the website, I explain it all in terms of menu commands, but in okay. terms of icons, it's, it's the one that has sort of four arrows in a little scrolling page. Okay. It's the, thir it's the fourth icon down on the left. Uh, I have a question, Joe. Um, yes. David. Uh, if when we're doing this in real life, are we always going to use as our starting place your project? 
Um, no, you should save your own prod. You should copy my project, save okay. it. And now, and from then on, that's your starting point. Okay, because I was going to ask, otherwise, how would I actually get the chart in there in the first place? Right. Since it's in your project, but I, you know, I, um, like if I, was, if I was doing this in Alaska or something, can I just pan over to Alaska from your project or do I need to get something? Yeah, you can totally go to Alaska. Um, okay. Um, so it seems like we'll, yours has everything we would need to, to create charts. We wouldn't need yeah. to import new information. You okay. should not need to import any information. Um, okay. It obviously is limited to NOAA charts. Um, yes. David so I, Bergsbacon, you had a question. We will get to you, Jane. Um, my question was basically um, this chart example that you provided us and walked us through had only the NOAA raster layer. Correct. Um, but you could do the same by adding other layers and it would include those like tides and I suppose currents and yep or let's put it let's put a grid on for instance I'll turn on the grid layer we'll go back to our layout select the map click refresh and there's our magnetic grid now that'll be in the PDF so it respects whatever layers you have up mm -hmm. or if we want God forbid you know a street map of the cranberries you know with a magnetic grid, we can have that. So all of this stuff is independent of what layers are up. Okay. Jane, you've been patient. Jane, did you have a question? You're muted, Jane. We can't hear you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just realized that. I'm I'm just going to follow along because I downloaded the wrong version and no wonder I was having so much trouble because it's really, it was, it would take forever to do anything and it was, you know. Yeah. So I'm going to start over from scratch and I'll just keep watching what you're doing and hope I can figure it out. Okay. And I'm sorry if uh, I wasn't emphatic enough about picking the right version. Um, yeah. The, the, ex, the, these you things are unstable were, enough. Probably me. The things are unstable enough without using the bleeding edge version of the software. Um, so Joe, quick question. Yes. Um, so it seems as, so your project is just calling in charts from NOAA. Yep. So the, it's sort of as we're panning around, we're re-downloading new information. Absolutely, that that's okay. right. And that okay. was that was what caused all the problems earlier in the week was I was using a different set of servers to get these maps and they kept crashing. Let's go to Alaska. Question. Do I have a question? Yeah, I always want to go to Alaska. Um, the uh, tides and currents, uh, how would that show up on a map? And the other question related to it is, can you set uh, date and time, you know, someplace in the future. I'm working on that, and I'll I'll give you a preview of it later in the workshop. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank Not you. yet, though. For now, it's just you can use these as a way to like, you know, link out, um, and get get the data from NOAA's web page. But we can do better than that, and we will. Um, so, Joe, is it possible? Um, and uh, if if you just want me to look at the, the recording, that's fine. But you showed in your example also, like honing in on the Cranberry Islands through the the, the template, you know, zooming and panning. Mm -hmm. And then you went to the layout manager and then you uh, selected map, but it showed the Isle of Shoals. Yeah. How did you get it to refresh to showing the cranberries again? Let's do the same thing here in Alaska. Let's uh, make a layout of this strait that we're looking at. We'll do this one in portrait mode. Okay, here's our new layout. It's not showing the right, again, it's Isle of Shoals, which we don't want. The first thing we need to do is select the map. I'm just gonna click in the map, bonk. 
Now on the right, there's a tab called item properties. And the very first thing in that item properties tab is a row of little icons. The first orange one, which shows an, an arrow kind of curling over a cube or something, it's really hard to see what it, what it is. The very first orange arrow icon changes um, changes this map, changes the layout map to show whatever the main map is. And what happened just now is really funny. Like, did you see how it all looks gray? Mm -hmm. That's because the grid lines on this map are so dense. I didn't realize how zoomed out I was in the main map. <laughs> That's kind of hilarious, I guess. No, wait, I'm not that zoomed out. What is, what's going you on? You know, if folks are having a time, hard time getting that item properties to show up, at least on my windows, I had to right click and get a drop down menu for item properties. Oh, like just clicking on map didn't do Okay, it. so I, maybe that's something that I already had set up and didn't understand exactly how. Yeah, but if you haven't set it up, you can click on it, right click, and then it'll give you item properties as an option. In fact, also weirdly, it's not really working for me right now. Like it's giving me a map that's much, much too zoomed out compared to what I'm looking at in the main map, which is like this. And this is just, doesn't seem right. Um, could, could you actually repeat that again? Um, is it JLo? So I, cause I'm not getting item properties at all. Like. Okay, let me get rid of it and bring it back yeah. again, and that'll be instructive. Yeah. So hold on a second. Sorry about all the window flipping. Don't understand why this grid is so messed up. Um, okay, let's make item properties go away. No more item properties. Where did it go? Uh, you, it looks like I may have to add this to the instructions. Let's go, let's look in the menus. Where can we find item properties? Now, Joe, what I did was I clicked on the map and then I right clicked. Yeah. And then it gave me a menu with options to add items. That's back. probably one way to do it. I just wanna see if there's a, nice, a nicer way than that. I couldn't find it anywhere else. Okay. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be anywhere else. So here I am in the map. I'm going to right click item properties. That's how you get to it, I guess. I just don't have that. <laughs> Page properties. All right. Strange. Okay. Well, anyway. Now, uh, all of these tabs actually have to be kind of forced in there. And um, obviously, um, it was something that I must have very early on set up without even realizing I'd set it up. So I apologize. There should have been instructions on how to get the tab in. And uh, I'm going to just make a note to myself to add that. <clears throat> okay. I, I'm not sure I rem I'm remembering correctly, Joe, and I've, I've uninstalled 3.18 and I'm reinstalling 3.16 okay. while we're talking, but I think in Windows that item properties comes up automatically. Yeah, maybe. I, I'm not sure. If, if even one of you didn't get it to come up, we need instructions on it. So there will be instructions. But right clicking on the map is certainly a way to get it. And once you get it up, it's not going to disappear by itself. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see what's next on the menu. We've made a chart. Made a couple of different charts. Oh God, I forgot what we have to do for that. It turns out that the reason my grid looked so weird is that this 
these islands in Alaska are apparently like way, way bigger than they look. <laughs> this map is just at an enormous scale. So there's somewhere where you control your grid. I can't remember where it is. Yeah, yeah, don't, we're not gonna get into that. That's, that's, that's gonna suck us into a rat hole. Um, okay, we've edited various things. We've exported the layout. Let's talk about how to get specific charts in your map. So far, everything we've been doing has been built around whatever charts NOAA gives us at whatever scale we're looking, right? So let's take, us, let's take ourselves back to Boston because that's an instructive example. Um, there's a little thing called spatial bookmarks in QGIS that you can use to remember different places that you go. So I'm gonna take us back to Boston. Here we are. Now, as we zoom in and out in Boston, you can see that NOAA is sort of choosing to give us different kinds of maps, depending on how zoomed in we are or are not. And if you make a map the way that I've just described how, you're gonna just get whatever they give you, which may be good, it may not be good. Like, I don't know, let's try, Let's try making a PDF of, um, let's actually go up to Salem Sound. That's gonna work a little bit better. Here's Salem Sound. I'm gonna make a PDF of this particular area. So um, let's just get, an, get a new layout, um, click the map sync the map with the main, the main map. Um, whoops, I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. We don't really, one, one issue is apparent right away. We don't know what we're getting, right? We look at this display and we see a very coarse map of Salem Sound. And it isn't until we get around to looking at the finished product that we see this, right? I think that's a problem. And I mean, I don't know how much you can see of the detail in this map but I'll tell you what a big problem is with it. It's too detailed. Like if you put this map on your lap or on, you know, in front of your spray deck and you're paddling, it's very hard to read. All the numbers are really little. The text is really little. It's, it's not the best map for this purpose. It's just the one that Noah happened to give, give us. Now, I mean, it's nice and crisp and everything, but um, it really makes sense, I find, to pick a map whose scale is tuned to what you're using it for. If it's, too day, if it's too coarse, it sucks. And if it's too detailed, it also sucks. So let's look at how to do that. There is a layer called RNC chart downloads. And I'm gonna bring that in here. If we zoom out from that, I'm just going to use the street map because it's not as cluttered for a second. You can see that these downloads are mostly kind of rectangles and they, I, they cover the whole area from Boston to um, the Bay of Fundy. I put these together for us because I know this is an area where most, most of us paddle a lot. I'm going to be adding more maps in the near future, but these are the ones we have now. Each of these is a downloadable map that you can choose to add to your project. It's not in it yet, but it's very easy to put it in it. So um, I'm, we're gonna do that for, Boss, for uh, Salem Sound, where we just were, if I can find it again. Okay, so there are a bunch of different maps that intersect this area. And we're gonna use a new tool in QGIS called the identify tool. It's, uh, you can get to it two different ways. You can use, um, 
and see what is it edit or view it's either view identify features is one way to get to it you can also get to it with this little eye information icon tool up at the top identify features there's a key shortcut for it too when you right click an area with identify features it'll show and, and this is the other thing you have to do you need to have that layer selected in the layers panel it will then um, show you all the different things that exist at that location and we you can see there is actually four different maps here there's one at 80,000 it's highlighting it's a very big rectangle there's one at 40,000 that's kind of on the diagonal there's one at 1 to 25,000 and there's one at 1 to 10,000 those are all Salem sound maps that we can have so we need to pick which one we want and I'm going to tell you as a rule of thumb I find the 40,000 map is nearly always the best one. So, but we don't have, to, we can experiment. Let's begin by, again, as I said, um, right clicking the area you're interested in, find the map that you wanna work with and start by going to preview map. This is gonna open a window from on Noah's website and you can use their zoom tools to kind of look around and see, well, what would you get if you downloaded this map? And the answer is we would get about this level of detail. I kind of love that. It's not too detailed, but it's got all the nav, mar nav markers on it. It's got some depths, it's got channels, you know, it's got most of the things I want. Let's look at one other one in preview mode just to see what we would get. I'll right click again, whoops accidentally just regular clicked. So irritating. Sorry. I'll right click again and let's look at the um, let's look at the 25 the uh, 25,000 map. So we'll preview this one. Yeah, this looks a lot like the one that Noah gave us in the first place. Sorry, it's, it's very sensitive to scrolling. Too small, type is too small. So I want the 25, I want the 40,000 map and I'm gonna download it now. So this time when I go to 40,000, I'm gonna select download map layer. And I'll get a little progress box while it downloads the map. It's a very big file. These, these map files are like 500 or 600 megabytes. Because they're not compressed. It's interesting that you're saying that you, you believe selecting the slightly larger map gives you the level of detail that you're interested in. Yeah, that's what I found. Since you're most interested in this example, I, I thought, you know, in Salem Sound or Marblehead Harbor. And the, I would think that the smallest chart would be the one that you would want, but. Yeah, no, I find that actually the smallest one, You, I just tried an exercise earlier today of making all four charts of Salem Sound that I could make at different scales. And the really detailed ones, if you printed them out and laminated them, you they'd be really hard to read. There's too much detail. Um, okay, so we got our download and you can see now over on the left, we have a new layer. Hugh just made a new layer for us with just this map. If we turn off everything else, that this is the only thing in our universe now. We can turn on the other layers and they fill in around it. You can see how it absolutely matches every, you know, it's oriented and positioned perfectly, providing detail for only this area. All right, so now let's go back to our layout. 
and our layout now shows only that stuff. I'm going to make it a little bigger. It's cheating, I know, but. And now if I export this, let's see, call it Salem Sound 2. And we'll pull it up. We'll pull it up over here. You can see, you'll, you'll see the difference. Still, my pizza is still spinning. There we go. Salem Sound 2. Acrobat doesn't want to show me the file right away. I have to make it smaller and bigger again, and then it comes in. So yeah, as you can see, there's much less detail, but I mean, you can, you can kind of get a sense of, um, I'll try to make these maps sort of similar to each other in terms of how they're positioned. You can see the difference. The type is just bigger in this one and there's fewer things on it. So I like that. I mean, you may not. And that's the great thing about the setup is you can pick exactly what you want that works for you. A uh, quick question, Joe. I, I've got like the map boxes. Now, how do I click to get to know it and download it? Is, which tool does that? The identify features tool. Okay. So if we go back to the main, the main map here, Right. You have to have a bunch of things lined up and working properly for right. this to happen. You have to have the chart downloads right. Uh, right. visible. You also have to select the layer on the left. Then you can right click with the identify tool and you'll see these choices. All right. So I think I have everything except which one is the identify tool. It's well, mm -hmm. uh, it is, it is explained in the website if you lose okay. track of it, but you can get to it either by the icon, which has a little eye with a circle, the traditional uh, info symbol, or okay. you can do um, view menu, identify features. All right, for some reason, mine is grayed out. And Maybe you, uh, that's weird. And, I, and the blobs are purple and boxes yeah. are purple. The default is that we don't have that RNC chart downloads layer is the default. Well, actually, the thing is, trying to figure out how to add it. No, you must be having an you must have an old version of the template, Janet, because I just added it today. All right, okay. I just Download used it today. Hmm. You don't I just have... I just used that template you sent today, and I don't have it either. Yeah. Um. If I so, look at my except template, I do have it all. I have a New England chart footprints template, but I don't have an RNC chart. Yeah, all of you folks must be looking at an NSPN workshop template with no number two on the end. Okay, all right. All right. Yes, correct, correct. All right, all right. That explains. You're not, you're not playing with the latest deck of cards, but all that's right. okay. I changed it on you today. Yeah. Very unfair. Well, I did that one already. Yeah. Very unfair of me. Yeah. Where, where's the new we one? We appreciate you anyway, Joe. Yeah, yeah well, I did it. I did it to make it easier for you. That's my only excuse. <laughs> Stop mailing out versions and put it on GitHub and then just leave a link to GitHub. It is on GitHub. It is? Okay. Yeah, right. yeah the problem is, well, anyway, yeah. this, this way of chart of downloading charts with one click was just added today. And I thought it was such a good feature that it was yeah. worth jerking you around a little bit. So Jane, you were looking at the old template, I assume, right? Yeah, I guess I am. Yeah. All right, so we've now covered um, making custom charts. And uh, I'll just show you a couple of other things. Let's, let's go to another part of New England. Sorry. Can't, can't use this program either.
Um, if you go somewhere, say up, you know, down east, and you you want to work with an area maybe that has like charts that oh kind of don't quite match up, Perfect. you know. What if I I actually am going on a trip paddling in this area, you know, around Jonesport. I hope later in the later in the season. And there's no single map that covers it. So this is another area where QGIS really sign, shines because um, I could download you know this map. Could also download this map over here. I think I ought to be able to have two downloads at once. Never tried it. Hopefully it works. Sorry. We'll see what happens. Anyway, those two will wind up matching just perfectly on the on the chart without any manual positioning needed. Yeah, it looks like my first one stopped, which was sad. The second one canceled the first one. And this will bring up an interesting issue with layers that um, this is the reason I wanted to show it to you. Okay, now we've got those two charts side by side. See them? Mm -hmm. And as we zoom in, it's going to be really, you can see where the seam is, but it's harder and harder to spot. It's right in this area. Like if we really come in close, you'll see where some numbers got cut off. And you can, you can even turn one, one on and the other one off to sort of see where they join. And you might decide, let's say you, something did get cut off like this number 43, say you wanted to see, I'm talking about this area here, there's a number that's cut off. Say you wanted to uncover that, you could change the order of the layers by dragging them around. I didn't talk about this yet, but it's important. So I'm gonna move the one that's on top under the other one by dragging it. And now that piece is uncovered. Things can cover each other up. So if you don't see what you expect to see, it could well be that it's just hidden. For instance, if I have open street maps up, you can't see it now because these guys are covering it. It's back there, <laughs> see? <laughs> it's behind them. But if you're zoomed in, you don't know it's there. Only if you uncover them or reorder will you notice that. So beware of layers obscuring each other. Also, don't export maps with many layers on top of each other, or the resulting PDF will include all of them. You won't notice it, but the PDF will be huge, and it'll take a long time to open. So only have the layers visible that you're really working with. All right, um, moving along. Um, let's talk about another kind of layer we can have, a route layer. So maybe I should, maybe I should take a few questions if there are any. Any burning questions? We're still gonna try to do a little troubleshooting at the end, so. Um, so let me just mention that, again, for, for Windows users, I tried getting the information from the tide and current stations, and I can't figure out how to get it in Windows. Hovering over them does nothing. Well, you don't just hover, hover you have to click, but we'll, we'll put that in our troubleshooting hat and okay. try to get to it at the end. Because that sounds the same as Dave Bergsbacon's um, issue. I have a, I'm kind of keying off of the class that we had around um, you know, weather and, and tides and currents and, and all yep. that for navigation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, could you, I mean, I see there's tides and, and currents here, you know, tide stations and current stations. Yeah. Could you add, say, something like a weather layer into this or? Yeah, I'm kind of experimenting with doing that. It's, it's, uh, 
It's something you can research too. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, down the road. All righty, um, let's talk about waypoints and routes. So waypoints is a layer that I put in so that you can just add markers. Let's turn it on, there's nothing in it. And um, let's say I wanna add a marker. Let's say I'm gonna launch from right here. Well, I don't know if you can see where my cursor is. There is a launch right there, I gather right on Moose Neck where that road ends. So I'm gonna select waypoints. This, I'll be moving fast, but I'm not doing anything that isn't already mentioned in the website. First of all, I have to turn on editing in my layer, which I can do by going to layer, toggle editing. They really made this inconvenient. Now I have to go to edit and say add point feature, which is another kind of tool for adding one point at a time. So I'm gonna click where I want my point feature and I'll give it a label, put in. And now here's my little marker, it says put in. I can click again somewhere else if I want some other feature. So there's my other feature. Just turn off the background so you can see them. So you can add your own features uh, for whatever purposes you want. And they remember where they are. They're, they're in their own layer. I haven't gone into this, but you can, you can change the way layers look. If you didn't like the red cross, obviously, you know, well, why not? A, how about a red cross? Um, how about not a cross at all, but some other thing like a, I don't know, a star. <laughs> there are a lot of choices in this program, so I'm not going to get into all of that, but um, you have a lot of control over how things look. Um, now I want to talk about route layers because this is really one of the cooler features that uh, we can do here. So um, we're going to use something called a plugin, which you will have to install. There's, explana there's an explanation of how to do it. In, again, in the website. It's called the Compass Routes plugin, which I wrote. Um, I'm going to take it out just so that I can put it in, show you how to put it in. So I'm going to quickly uninstall it. Okay, it's gone. So here's how to install the plugin. Again, you don't have to memorize this. I'm just going to do it in front of you. Open the plugins window, you have to go to settings and say show experimental plugins because this is not a sort of official baked in plugin yet. Um, and then you will go to not installed and search for the word compass routes. And there it is. Author Joe Berkovitz, that's me. So we'll install it. This is going to download it download it from the QGIS plugins website and put it in our copy of QGIS. Once it's there, it'll stay there. It's not part of the project. It's gonna be added into your copy of the QGIS application. So there, now it's in. And we've got two new tools in our toolbar, a compass needle with a little arrow and a compass needle with a bunch of little red grid lines behind it. So, they even have little tool tips that tell you what they do. One of them is called create compass route layer. So um, I'm gonna do that one first. It brings up a big dialogue in which you don't have to say anything except run. And once you run it, it creates a new layer called routes that we have over here. And routes is a layer that can contain lines. So add line feature. And now I'm going to add a line from here to say here. And that line automatically gets labeled with distance and magnetic bearing. So figures out you know, where magnetic north is in this location. And it also knows, because it's a, this is a geographic app, how long the arrow is in nautical miles and what the angle of the line is. So you can put roots together here 
And each of the legs will be labeled for you automatically. Nice. And of course you can print those. It's a little finicky, like you have to do a sequence of left clicking and then left clicking again and then right clicking. It's quite annoying. But once you get the hang of that, you can make routes that way. And of course these can be printed. They're a separate layer again on top of everything that turns on and off. So that could go in that could go in the map that you then print from your layout. Um, this the other function of this plugin is if you were somewhere else like Alaska, for instance, um, where you didn't have grid lines that I already made for you, you could make them. So um, let's say we want to make grid lines for this area. Um, just click that say use map canvas extent, which means draw grid lines for wherever the main map is pointed, run, and uh, made some grid lines for me. And I guess they are uh, 16 degrees off in this area. In fact, if we go back to routes and make a route line that goes exactly along one of these magnetic grid lines, it should say zero magnetic, and it does. Thank goodness. <laughs> Earlier today, it did not do that, and I panicked. It turned out I had a bug in the, uh, the bearing calculation, which was very embarrassing. All right, that's routes and waypoints. So um, with that, we've kind of covered a whole lot of the bread and butter things. And um, we could really devote the rest of the session to sort of troubleshooting and or talking about what's in the future, because I'm continuing to work on some stuff for title planning that I think will be very cool. But um, we should also, you know, talk about where raster charts are going because NOAA is discontinuing them. And um, that's going to affect all of us. We won't, we'll still be able to get them probably, but they won't be maintained anymore. And gradually they'll become more and more, I mean, less and less accurate, yeah. So NOAA is in the process of replacing all of these. What? And uh, what they have to replace it doesn't yet look all that awesome, but let's get to that later. Um, this might be a good point to kind of break again, take some questions, uh, talk about, let's see if we can get the, the people who couldn't identify uh, tide stations, see if we can get them working. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share and let one of them share a screen and we can see if we can figure it out. Question. Yeah. Um, so how do you erase stuff? I mean, you... Oh, yeah. Is that obvious? You put in these routes and maybe you said, oh, I don't want to do that. Let's do something else. Uh, and so you want to unclutter it with the... Yeah. So the whole... First of all, you may notice some of these layers here have a funny little symbol that looks like a bug um, next to them. And that means it's a temporary layer. So when you save the project, that won't get saved. So these are kind of temporary. Um, you can save them if you want. I explain how in the, the, the website, but you asked specifically, how do I get rid of them? You use the select tool, you select them, and then you hit delete and they're gone. Great, thanks. You can also undo that. So I just undid them and you can undo their addition. So I'm just hitting uh, Command Z and they're, they're disappearing one by one. Goodbye. Yeah, so there's that. More questions? David Bergsbacken, um, do you wanna see if we can figure out how your identify tool is broken? Uh, or did you get it to work? No, I never got it to work. I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, do you see my screen? I totally see your screen. Okay. So I, um, I turn did on the tides and currents. And 
Yeah, and you need to zoom in a little bit so you're not seeing the so many numbers. The numbers are overlapping tide stations and current stations. They combine into a numbered thing. And the numbered thing isn't really interactive. Okay. Well, I just wanted to go to your example because that's what you had. Oh, okay. But uh, I can't see any tide stations now. There's one. Okay, stop, stop moving around, you got one. So first you've got to select the tide stations layer on the left or nothing will happen. Try, there you go. Now move you the hand, caref carefully move the hand down until it's over the link, view station data. And Probably it opened up a Chrome window. Can you open up Chrome and see if it made Chrome go to that place or? Yep, it did. Okay, so the difference apparently is it doesn't automatically open the window on your machine, but it did create, it created it. It just didn't bring it to the front. And that's probably a difference in the way that Windows manages Windows. <laughs> The, the thing that I had noticed on, on your setup is as opposed to mine, and, and there may be something different I have versus you, but I swear in your setup, whereas right now I'm showing, and I'm not moving it, it's, it's just a hand. But I swear on yours, you had an arrow. That's probably because I was using a different tool. I might've been using the identify tool or, um, yeah, I was probably just using a different tool. My, I, sometimes mine stays a hand also. Uh, I've noticed the same thing. So I was trying to find that, that tool, the selector tool, but I... Maybe that's just a current station. So, so I was having yeah. the same trouble, um, but I, when you just went through it again, in addition to having the check, I thought you just had to have the check mark next no, to... No, you need to actually track. select that Right, line. and that made all the difference. <laughs> yes, it does make all the difference. It's very, very fussy that way. Yeah. I mean, it bites me all the time. I'm like, it's not working. It's not working. Oh, I didn't select the layer. Right. Yeah. So what happens if I do that? I select tides and currents. And then if I go and left click on one of them, it centers it. And if I right click on it, it asks me if I want to copy the coordinate. Yeah. Well, David, uh, David B, why don't you unshare your screen so we can see what Jim is doing? Ah, sure. Because I don't trust anybody when they talk about what they're doing. <laughs> Very distrustful. Ah. All right. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what to do. So don't start. Don't be all clicking around now, okay? <laughs> um, I've totally lost my screen here. Well, we see it. You do? <laughs> we see QGIS. What have you lost? I've lost everything else. But Oh, I see what's wrong. Okay. So you see my cursor moving I around. see your cursor. I see your innermost thoughts. Okay. Um, so first of all, before you do anything else, click the show tool tips icon at the top. It is the little speech bubble icon, third from the right in the top row. Um, well, third from the right in the top row. Because my, it's hidden. No, no we see right it. There. It's right there. Oh, it's hidden by your own screen sharing yeah. thing. Right, right. Third from the right in the top row. This there one we go. Yeah, it was hit. It was probably covered up by your screen yeah, sharing. It thingy. was. Okay. Next, let's look at a current station. Select the current stations layer. That means you're going to click the name current stations in the layers window. No, that's the, that's the group name. Click current stations. That's a layer, right? The other thing is a group. Now hover. 
violently. Ah. So I can't get them both at once. No, you can't get them both at once. That's correct. All right. So that makes sense. If and I don't know. Um, it's probably sent some browser somewhere to go look at that it, page. It did. It opened up in Chrome elsewhere. OK, good, good. I, I have two screens. All right. So QGIS isn't totally broken. And we figured out that Windows just behaves differently. Joe, I just tried to do the plugin for Roots. And yeah. it's when you get to, I get to this far as clicking the box for the experimental, whatever you call it. Um, and there's no place to search. Yeah, you, you don't search there. You search in not installed. Okay, I did that. That's what I did, sort of found that and I found it, but it didn't install it. Okay, so um, share your screen. Oops, I'm gonna go to you guys. Share screen. That's one thing everybody can do. You did install it. I see the tools. Okay. Yeah, okay, but isn't it supposed to say roots here somewhere? No, you have to make the roots layer with the so, left, not that that's the grid one, but that makes a layer too. There you go. Now oh, click so run, click run at the bottom. The, oh, run, oh, as run as no, a batch pass? No, oh, no, oh, just regular one. old run. Uh, okay. Now you've oh, got a roots layer. Gotcha. And the it's roots not, layer, it put it in a bad place as you can see. So I see. can move it though. You right? can move it, yeah. You move it somewhere else. There you go, yeah. Okay, so now the other thing is, since you're looking at my screen, you had a whole nother sort of windowy thing like this. Yeah, but I it didn't use it and you don't need it. Okay. I just was, I was getting confused by that too. All right. Thank it's you. It's probably another thing that I added without realizing I added it. Okay. Joe, okay. I got distracted when we were doing the roots thing. Is that covered in the, yes. on your website? Yes, it's covered. I'll figure it out. And you can always ask me. I have another one with regard to item properties if you got a minute. Yeah, sure. You want me to share? Hang on, I'm trying to unshare. How, where, where'd you all go? In the upper middle. There's an end, end share button somewhere. But I've, I've lost the whole group. I'm gonna to stop you from oh, sharing. Here we go. I kicked you off. Oh, okay, great, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Let's see. Oh, we have a new person. Um, so you can see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, so if I go to Layout Manager, it sees the Isle of Shoals. Mm -hmm. And I've selected the map. Select the map, and I'll right click. I do see item properties here yeah. now. Click it. Hmm. Hmm. Is it appearing in some other window? Do you have another screen somewhere? It's really quite bizarre. Um, oh, I noticed your, can you close, make the window smaller, if you would, make the layout window smaller. Uh, sure. Just switch back to the layout window, and make it smaller. Okay, there's your item properties. Oh, Select the map and it was floating was what it was floating under something. So David, stop for a second, stop for a second. Take that, I grab that item properties header and drag it and make it dock in the bottom of that panel. You just drag it around. You can get it to kind of stay there. There you go. There you go. Now it'll stay there. Now select the map. 
just select the map by clicking regular alt click. There you go. You got it for a second. You clicked the lock also inadvertently just then. So you probably locked it and can't change anything, but you can, you can fix that. All right, now well, you have your I, tab. Yeah, at least I see it now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Th that's yeah, the so way. Basically, it was there, but it was it was behind something. Yes, QGIS is very. It's another fussy thing about the way it deals with panels. All right. Given that we don't have that much time left and people are starting to leave, I want to take a minute and talk about the future a little bit. So, um, the first feature I want to talk about is Noah's future. They seem to have one, which is good. Um, so I'm going to look at we're going to look at a different project now. Yeah. So. Here's good old, good old NOAA charts, mouth of Portsmouth Harbor. And you can't believe how much work goes into these charts. It's just, it's, un, it's unreal how much, how many man hours went into them. Um, but they can't keep pouring all that time into the printed charts and <laughs> deal with the digital world, which just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So surprise, they're, digit, they're ditching the printed versions and they're going to put more and more work into enhancing the digital ones. So they have a prototype of that, which we can look at. It's not, not gonna make you super excited to look at. I mean, it's a lot uglier and harder to read, in my mm -hmm. view. But uh, it has some things going for it. I mean, it's always sharp <laughs> at every resolution. Yeah, and if you're at the helm of a 400 foot tanker, this is probably all you need. Yeah, I mean, and you have, look, you've got all these different options of things you can turn on and off too, which is kind of cool. You can't do that with a printed chart. So you can have, you know, just the seabed, the land, you know, pipelines, traffic routes, um, you know, different areas. You can turn all the lights and markers. You can turn them all on and off. That's pretty nice. Um, you don't always need the, all of them all the time, I guess. But the typography has got so many problems right now. It's like very hard to make out the labels for many things. Like over here, you've got this light here. I mean, the label for the light is exactly the same size. It's even smaller than the depth markings. You can go look at the printed version of that. It's really easy to read, isn't it? So they've, they've got some work to do, <laughs> but they are doing the work. Um, you know, they know that they've got to, they've got to step up. So, so, um, if you're interested, they have uh, a prototype. You can, you can look up uh, NOAA print on demand charts. It's kind of a little prototype they put together. It only does the new style charts, but it does print on demand. So you could actually like get a PDF of any chart area you want, as long as it's in this format. It kind of does the same thing that we're trying to do here with QGIS, but on a, in a website. But the output format looks like this and it's, it's pretty hard to use compared to the old style ones. But I think that is the future. Like when they get this looking as good as the old ones or at least as usable, that'll become a very useful website because there'll be no more finding the chart you want. You'll go there, you'll zoom to the area you want. You'll say, I want a PDF of that. It'll make it and give it to you. Are they gonna put it's in topography easy. lines? I asked them that and they said, good idea. <laughs> So let's hope they do. Joe, is it free? It's free. Cool. What's the format? 
the format the, the format of the map you get out of it is pdf no what i mean what what are they using to generate it oh it it's generated from all these databases of what's where that they've got that they put together the same sources that they use to make the printed maps only a different process and it's obviously much less human powered so you know whereas somebody actually decided oh you know for this marker here we're going to you know, position the type over to this side so it's out of the way of that thing. I mean, this is all just a computer doing it. So they've got to have some algorithms that are smarter than the ones they use now. I think there's another, they're, they're forecasting another couple of years at least before they do the switch. I sure hope they take their time. Um, okay. Last thing I want to talk about is sort of what I'm doing next with this, because this whole QGIS business is going to continue to evolve, I hope. So um, I am working on title planning because I get very excited, unreasonably excited about that. So here's a version of, um, I'm going to use OpenStreetMap because it's a little less cluttered. Here's, a, here's some, some current stations and I have a plugin now that loads data for these current stations on a given date. So, and we can step uh, back and forth in time and see what the tides are doing, which is pretty fun. So you can see I'm kind of controlling the time over here, going earlier. And if I click on a specific station, We'll get a nice graph and a table, just the same as what you would get from the website. But um, the difference, of course, is you have much more of an overview here. Like as I pan this map around, you know, it's going to load load additional data. If any of you have ever used fish currents, so far it's a little bit like look probably looks a little bit like fish currents to you. Um, and if we go to the station page. Hopefully it'll show us a graph that looks kind of like the one we were just looking at. Yes, it does. I'm relieved. Um, so, um, but what's kind of cool about this in the context of making maps is that we could say, so maybe if we're planning a trip, we might say, be especially interested in what's going on um, right here. So maybe I would select this station and say, create an annotation. And now, for map making purposes, I've got a saved table that's here in my map that when I print the map out is gonna be part of that. So this is a, this annotation is a, a QGIS thing. There's a special tool to uh, move them around and make them bigger and smaller. It's, you can see it's sort of got a, a pointer that's going to the location of the current station. So you could have a few of these on your map and when you print your you know, map to take with you, you might have these annotations on the map to remind you when, when, what the current is doing when at this particular spot. And you could add more, more annotations in other places. So that's kind of the idea behind this. Um, gonna do the same for tides as well, but I'm doing currents first because they're a lot harder. Obviously you could change the date on this too. So we might want, to look a couple of dates ahead. Maybe I'm considering, oh, maybe I'm considering something a week from the 21st also. So that's gonna have its own, its own table and maybe we'll make an annotation for that too. So now I can compare those. So that's, that's next for me. Um, and that about wraps it up for what I wanted to get to. Um, we're a little bit before nine. That's good. We can, we can break now or I'm happy to stick around if folks have more things they want to ask or talk about. Joe, yeah, um, is there a reasonably easy way to get things from multiple parts of, in, of the chart into the same PDF? 
Like if yes, you there to, is. There is. If you want to take, you know, like especially if you've got a coast that's kind of diagonal and you want to have like two parts next to each other. Totally. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, let's do that. Let's do exactly that. I'm going to make a new layout. Um, yeah, how do I do that again? <laughs> oh, there's my tide annotations, how nice. Let me turn those pesky arrows off. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's say I wanted to have uh, some of this map and I also want something that's sort of nearby. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm making this map a little smaller. It's got its own grid, you may notice. I'm just gonna reposition it a little bit. Oh, look, there's a little screen, screen garbage problem here. All right, anyway, um, looks like the annotations are overflowing it, but let's just, uh, let's just turn the annotations off. It's, there we go. Now, what I can do is actually copy and paste the whole map to make another map. And that one will then pan independently. So um, let's copy this map. I just hit copy, you probably can't see that. And now I'll paste another one. Oh, look, another map. And I can pan this one independently. So maybe this one is gonna look, um, maybe this one's gonna show Brave Boat Harbor and. Chauncey Creek in detail, you know, I'll do a little blow up. So it's got its own grid. It could also have its own scale bar. I haven't done that. Um, if we wanted to really fit more stuff, sometimes you might want to rotate the map. It's kind of a cool feature for fitting more in. Of course, the grid rotates too. So yep. that's how you do multiple maps in a single PDF. The rotation feature works really well for a coastline that's, that's yeah. diagonal to the grid. Just so. I'm curious, um, like what other things have you thought of or high in the sky things could you imagine that there's some, you've probably given this much more time than, than we have. Well, here's a couple, I'll, I'll give you a couple of them. Um, so I give this example in the website um, and it's kind of a good one. Um, here, here's a public database of wind turbines and I'm just gonna download, um, download that data and drag it into QGIS. And let's just add that as a layer. Um, oh, that didn't work very well. Let's, uh, never mind. I should have used this other format instead, GeoJSON. It's going to take a little longer to load. I'm kind of into wind turbines for some reason. I think they're really good for navigation. You can see them from way off. And does New Hampshire have any? Yes. You ought to see them now. Um, if they're hard to see with this map. Let's see. I didn't see any. I don't know where they are, Jim. No, oh, I, I, oh, I turned them off. I keep turning them off by mistake. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my way to some turbine somewhere, but they're, they're, not, uh, they're not showing up. There's one on Jiminy Peak in Western Mass. I'm trying to think where there's one. Oh, Windmill, what about Windmill Point at Hall? Yeah, I'm just trying to go to Windmill Point actually um, to see, why do I not see any? There are a number of them in Gloucester. I, I oh, there, there we go. They just showed up. Here's, here they are. They're, they're, they're these dots here. So, um, 
So there we go. There's one, there's windmill point right down there. And if we use the identify tool on windmill point, we'll get a whole raft of information about it. Here it is. It's, it's, uh, it's got the height in here somewhere. So is that a windmill layer that you created or? No, it it's just like a publicly available database that oh. there's tons of them around. Like there's all kinds of stuff you can just import into this environment and it will show up on top of the map. There could be recent Sasquatch sightings or something it could, like that. It could indeed <laughs> be that. It can be COVID data. I mean. Dark sightings. Yeah, and then you can play with how you label this. You know, you can change all kinds of things about, you could make the dots bigger if the turbine is higher. It's a whole world. So that's one thing. Uh, weather, you mentioned weather. Weather is another thing. So let's go find some weather. Um, let's see, geo JSON weather data. API web service, current weather data, open weather map. I don't know, that's probably not gonna help us. Joe, I had a thought. So anyway, I, you know, I'm, I'm, fish, I'm going on a fishing expedition, so I, I don't wanna waste your time. Yes, Joe, what was your if, thought? If you have uh, weather data, then um, in Portsmouth Harbor, for instance, if it's been raining for the last week, the uh, currents are very different than they are if it hasn't been. So yeah, and that's Chicago right. River has got a lot more force you know, at slack or at um, ebb tide than it does at uh, flood. Now, I think that NOAA, the predictions that I'm using, they ought to reflect that. They're coming, they're predictions from NOAA. They're not kind of tide table type predictions. Okay. But uh, I need to research that a little more. There, there is something called the uh, NOAA operational forecast system. Okay. And, I assume uh, that tides are otherwise just you know, historical, uh, you know, based on um, you know gravitational and other historical. Yeah. Data. Well, but take a look at this. So this is actually um, the CV Island tides right. in the Piscataqua, and this is uh, an actual forecast based on all the current conditions that that no one knows about. So including rainfall, including rainfall, right. I would love to integrate these. I don't know yet if there's a way to bring these in conveniently to QGIS, but maybe you want to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope there is, it would be very cool to ha access this. This is only available for certain areas in the United States, this kind of thing. Well, it's probably only relevant for certain areas, you know, for that too. extreme example. Um, the Bay Area has probably the best version of this, but here are all the locations that you can get that for right now in our area. Okay. So yeah, I, I don't know if there is an API for grabbing that stuff and importing it. I'm not, I, I don't think there is yet. Cool. Yeah. I think cool is really uh, the word of the day here. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of possibilities and you know, no one can scratch the surface, so. Right. Well, thank uh, you. Curiosity, yeah, are you job. magic, any kind of um, like a phone-based app um, for the types of things that you're kind of playing with? Um, well, there are phone-based apps that do bits and pieces of this and, uh, I'm, I'm more motivated to leave it in this environment and to try to get it into app form because to me, um, it's hard to, it's very compute intensive. It actually sucks up a lot of the power of even a reasonably powerful computer. So the phone is very good for presenting information to you. It's not as good for searching, for correlating, for really kind of doing in-depth things. So on the phone, I'm happy to hop from one thing to another. I'll go to fish currents for currents. I'll go here for this and there for that. This is more of an integration environment for making a finished map. So um, I'm not really trying to bring this to the phone and um, 
I think the environment isn't really designed to work on mobile. This is very much a desktop type of environment. Uh, Garmin also has, if you subscribe to the satellite service in reach, you have weather yeah. information there and you also have right. uh, like other stuff. It's whatever, $15 a month or something. Absolutely. There's good stuff. My focus here is very much on sort of long-term, like longer range planning. Long range could mean next week, but I mean, it's not so much about weather. It's more about things you can predict well in advance, like geography and current. But those are just my interests. I mean, I go to Windy when I want weather. I don't go here. All right, what's Windy? You got my curiosity. Uh, well, Windy is a windy.com. Just go to windy.com and check it out and okay. play with it. It's a, it's a very nice weather app. It's web-based and uh, also has mobile version. And uh, it's a great way to get weather, weather data. Love it. All right, guys. Thank you. It's uh, almost nine. Really I really appreciate the chance to share this. It, it, it's very, um, very enjoyable for me, and I hope it's useful for you. No, yeah, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah, I can't yeah. wait to really work with it. Yeah, if you had fun, Joe, I'd like to see this about six more times. So I'm going to watch the recording at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I better Thank stop you. recording while I still have disk space. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.